My name is uh, Colin McDonald, uh, and I'm Professor of Psychiatry in uh, University of Galway, and I'm also a consultant psychiatry, psychiatrist in University Hospital Galway. So I work half-time clinically looking after patients, many of whom have uh, bipolar disorder, and I also uh, work as an academic, kind of teaching students and postgrads, but also have a research program which focuses upon psychosis broadly, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, and investigating causes and treatments of those disorders. So I've been involved with the Enigma Bipolar Working Group for the last couple of years and I've always had an interest in the neuroanatomical changes that are present in, in bipolar disorder. So it's really great to be able to, to combine that side of the Enigma Bipolar Disorder Working Group to look at uh, MRI structural brain changes uh, that are associated with the disorder and associated with various aspects of the disorder. I lead one project within that, which is the uh, medications and clinical phenotype looking specifically at changes in subcortical brain regions and bipolar disorder. So when we think of bipolar disorder and the sort of brain changes it's associated with, lots of evidence indicates that these older parts of the brain involved in emotional regulation, parts of the brain like the hippocampus, the amygdala, the thalamus, the anterior cingulate, the so-called anterior limbic system, that these parts of the brain seem to be uh, abnormal both anatomically and functionally. So they're reduced in size and also um, seem to be hyperactive and disconnected in bipolar disorder. So uh, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in doing is, is not just um, confirming in large samples such as is available through Enigma uh, that these anatomical structures are uh, changed in size, but also seeing what they vary with in terms of the uh, clinical variables and types of medications that, that, that patients are taking. I've been a consultant psychiatrist for about 20 years now and we have a, a specialist uh, a clinic dealing with patients with bipolar disorder so I see quite a lot of patients in my clinical practice. Uh, it's a fascinating disorder of course although devastating for those often who have it. Um, in terms of diagnosing bipolar disorder the, the key thing of course about bipolar disorder is that it's a mood disorder and as such is an episodic illness so most patients will have episodes of mood abnormality. Uh, interspersed with periods of relative normality. And it's those episodes of mood abnormality that of course are very distressing and, and during which there can be great disruption to people's social and occupational activities. It's uniquely within psychiatry a triphasic illness insofar as patients will have episodes of, of, of elated mood, uh, of normal mood and, and of depressed mood. And the treatment is quite different for those different phases of the illness. Bipolar disorder is actually quite straightforward to diagnose when it appears in its prototypical form. If somebody has a florid, manic episode where they are very overactive, they're very over-talkative, they're not sleeping, they're agitated, distressed, they may be very socially disinhibited. I've seen patients, for example, who would maybe strip naked in public and have delusional beliefs about bringing peace to earth, for example, or spreading religious messages. That's fairly straightforward to diagnose because it's very, very typical uh, in, in that prototypical form. Where it gets more challenging is, is where it's not prototypical, where people with maybe in a, in a manic uh, episode present predominantly with psychosis. And there is this overlap then perhaps with schizophrenia that can be difficult to distinguish it from. Or when people don't have those florid manic episodes where their episodes of being elated are much more mild and where they predominantly might present with episodes of low mood or depression. And it's very common for people uh, with bipolar disorder to have been misdiagnosed with unipolar depression because they might have mild episodes of elation, so-called hypomania, during which they feel quite good, their activity can be goal-directed, uh, they might be quite creative and functional during those periods, they may not last too long and they may not be associated with too much social dysfunction, for example. Uh, and then they may uh, only go for medical help when they're having an episode of unipolar depression Sometimes, or actually quite commonly, those might be treated by their doctor. Uh, those episodes might be treated with antidepressants, which aren't as effective for bipolar depression and also are much more likely to destabilize the course of the illness. So that's where the diagnosis becomes more tricky in terms of those uh, cases which overlap either on the one side with depression and on the other side with, with schizophrenia. And the other area that I'd say about diagnosis, which can be challenging is because of the extent of comorbidities with other disorders. So some patients, for example, uh, may have um, emotionally unstable personality disorder, where, which are characterized by predominantly 
more short or briefer episodes of mood instability. Uh, and that can be misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder, but it's actually also commoner as a comorbidity with bipolar disorder, where patients may engage in a lot of alcohol or substance misuse and end up having a primary diagnosis of, of an addiction or a dependence syndrome, whereas actually uh, their main diagnosis is bipolar disorder. So those are where the diagnostic difficulties predominantly emerge. You know, no, no psychiatrist is fully happy with diagnoses and they change all the time and new classification manuals come out every 10 years where they've been refined or sometimes ex extra diagnoses are, are added to. Uh, I think the reason that diagnoses have stuck over the last maybe few decades since the initial introductions of DSM-2 really in, in the 19, 1970s is because they're useful. They're, they're useful because they support scientific research in terms of epidemiology, psychiatric genetics, neuroimaging, obviously the field we're talking about, and in particular clinical trials. And prior to these uh, diagnoses that, that, that have developed and been refined, uh, when we didn't have diagnoses, essentially that undermined the capacity for scientific research within psychiatry. Uh, and the diagnoses, um, blunt though they are, are useful tools for at least being able to talk about broadly the same cluster of symptoms in different parts of the world, different services. And, and doing those sorts of, of, of scientific research. But uh, of course they are very heterogeneous, of course they are very blunt uh, uh, tools and, and need further, further refinement. And when we look at other branches of medicine where uh, there's been a pro progress from diagnosing a disorder on the basis of its symptoms to understanding its etiology, then that leads to much more targeted and precise treatments. If one thinks of something like I suppose in the 19th century consumption, where somebody might have a fever and is coughing up blood, uh, the, it was a clinical diagnosis and eventually it was realised that this is actually caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And once that was identified, you could go on and get a targeted treatment for that particular effective, uh, effective agent. So the great um, quest in psychiatry is to try and find biomarkers for our syndromes so that we can come up with, I suppose initially, more precision or personalized treatments and then obviously learn more about the underlying etiopathogenesis of these disorders and develop new treatments. I, I like to think uh, of the glass being half full rather than half empty in this regard. I mean I, the brain has been described as the most complex structure in the known universe and it clearly uh, probably is. There's probably uh, you know, hundreds of billions of connections between, uh, between neurons forming these networks within the brain. The fact that we've made any progress at all in the last few decades, we should, we should be grateful for. Of course, we have so much more to do, and I'm sure this project will go on for many, many decades or centuries before we uh, you know, get to the end of this path. But uh, I think that uh, ultimately, that's the, the intention of biomarkers. What I would say is that we don't even have to necessarily know uh, deeply what the etiopathogenesis of the disorders is to make progress of biomarkers. So when it comes to something like uh, imaging, if we're able in large enough numbers uh, across the varied manifestations of these disorders and over time to be able to identify some sort of biological metric which can predict um, prognosis or can help predict what the best treatments, even amongst the treatments we have, are, well then that's the first step towards getting a successful uh, biomarker uh, in psychiatry and that's the, the route which we're really on. So even disorders which we do know more about their pathology, like Alzheimer's disease, for example, there's, there's, you know, the, the progress has been made there, but uh, still a lot more to be done really before we can actually predict a, uh, the best treatment on the basis of, uh, of a biomarker, be it a serum test uh, peripherally or, or, or brain imaging. In contrast to dementia, of course, we do have treatments that work for bipolar disorder, and that's another area where I think we, you know, the glass is half full. I mean, if we contrast bipolar disorder now to the way in which it was treated some decades ago, where essentially uh, there was no effective treatments. Patients were essentially sedated and institutionalized until the episode of mania burnt itself out. Now our treatments between the dopamine antagonists and mood stabilizers like lithium and valparate, uh, we successfully treat manic episodes uh, really almost all the time. Greater than 90% of patients can respond to these treatments within a matter of days or weeks and that that sort of is just as successful as treating uh, infections with antibiotics and something that we should be uh, essentially proud that we've made that progress and we can help those patients 
uh, prevent uh, substantial periods of institutionalization, which used to be the norm uh, for this disorder. Of course, there's so much more to do and the treatments have side effects. And one of the uh, other problems is that our treatments for bipolar depression are probably more or less optimal than, than, than bipolar mania. And even within that treatment for bipolar disorder, we still aren't very, very clear about the optimal treatment for, for, for each person. So there's still a fair bit of trial and error, um, maybe clinician preference goes on. And sometimes for the patients who don't respond Im immediately, you, you, you're, you have to try a second or a third one. And often for the patients that are a bit more difficult to manage, especially in terms of preventing future episodes, we move towards several different medications, so polypharmacy, and those medications have side effects, so so much more can be done. But I think even with our existing treatments, biomarkers could help us to make progress towards that goal of personalized treatment for individual patients or precision medicine or precision psychiatry in the case of treating bipolar disorder.